So my name is Dean. I'm here to talk to you about the blockchain. How many of you, how many of you have heard of blockchain? And how many of you have heard of Bitcoin? Okay, so pretty much all of you. And so I was kind of the same way when I started a couple months ago. I kind of had the surface understanding of Bitcoin, but I didn't really know how it worked. So I decided to research it for my topic, and I dug a lot deeper. And I quickly discovered that the underlying technology for Bitcoin is called blockchain. So blockchain on a high level <coughs> is essentially a public ledger that all the transactions of Bitcoins uh, are posted on that everyone has access to the network. So basically, if you think of the blockchain as the internet of value, where the internet is uh, the like the value of the internet is communication, the value of the blockchain is value itself. So um, essentially, uh, basically, just like the internet, the real value of the blockchain is the fact that it's universally accessible and that anybody can access it and make improvements to it. So it's completely open source. Now today, the banks and a lot of institutions are in charge of uh, basically organizing all transactions. So like say, say, say two institutions want to make a transaction, they have to go through a clearinghouse or a bank who basically keeps the record, does all the due diligence, and before sending it along. So that's why it takes like a week before you uh, make a stock purchase and before that stock actually shows up uh, in your portfolio. And so what blockchain does is it basically takes that record from the clearinghouse and it gives it to everybody so everyone has access. And so transactions occur on a peer-to-peer -peer basis as opposed to uh, through a centralized system. Now, um, concerning Bitcoin and blockchain, one of the really uh, interesting things about blockchain comes to fruition when you think about the fact that in the US, 30% of people are unbanked or underbanked, which means essentially that you either that they don't have a bank or they have a bank and they don't use it. And the reason for this is that using a bank is very expensive. It costs about $200 to open a bank account, uh, give or take, and it also costs a lot of money to maintain it uh, on a month to month basis. And this 30% number actually goes up. Uh, internationally, McKinsey did a report that basically showed that 50% of adults in developing countries like Africa and Latin America don't have access to a bank account because of economic reasons. Bitcoin, on the other hand, it doesn't cost any money. So even if you do have a bank account, you can save a lot of money by using a Bitcoin system. You can send money internationally completely free. So it opens the door to a lot of these unbanked people to get, have access to the free flow of capital and uh, economic opportunity. <coughs> so blockchain for cryptocurrency, uh, as I said, like, so blockchain uh, is the underlying system for Bitcoin, but you can take those rails and you can apply it to a lot of other industries. So like banking system, you can apply it to like Uber or any sort of like um, transactional system like a, like a ride sharing system, for example. So first of all, I just want to dive into the cryptocurrency side of things. So blockchain was first introduced with Bitcoin in 2009, and that was the first sort of like manifestation of blockchain in an actual like case study. And so um, it was very, this technology was extremely exciting to technologists, and by 2011, there was about 15 cryptocurrencies that came online, and today there's about 600. And so what that basically resulted from was a huge amount of technological interest and a lot of very intelligent people funded venture capitalists threw their money and technological expertise behind this technology because it was very exciting and because Bitcoin was so, was so successful. But there's a lot of limitations to Bitcoin. It's expensive. If you review the, uh, basically the comparison between the Bitcoin network's energy usage on, uh, based on the average household energy usage, the Bitcoin network takes about as much energy to run as 173,000 uh, US households. And if you compare it to the Visa network, it's about 50,000. And then if you take the basically the magnitude, the orders of magnitude of transactions that occur um, on the Visa network versus Bitcoin, that works out to about 5,000 times more energy per transaction. So the scalability of Bitcoin is, is seriously challenged by this energy usage. Now, I started to dig deeper and I discovered that, that this underlying blockchain technology is really exciting if you think about its applications for finance in general. And so there's two companies that I want to highlight, which is Ethereum and Hyperledger, and these are two companies that in the last eight to 10 months have come out with a blockchain technology that comes with its own operating system. And this allows for companies basically, like say banks or Uber, <coughs> to the blockchain is downloaded, punch in 48 lines of code, and you have your own blockchain. So basically you can imagine taking companies and putting it on its own ledger using what's called a smart contract system. So basically you can imagine companies running on blockchain without any centralized system. You just have an idea, you throw it on the blockchain, and you have a company, that's it, that's all it takes. So blockchain for a minute, so I actually sat down with someone at Stanford a couple weeks ago named David Nazarius, who wrote his own blockchain system called Stellar Consensus Protocol. And what Stellar does was it basically was optimized for remit services. And what remit says is basically you send like one person if they want to send 100 bucks to someone else, right now they have to use like a Western Union service, and this can cost like 20% off the top. And so it's really, it actually really affects poor people because poor people don't have the extra resources to like take that 20% cut. What Stellar does is it basically gives weight to the transactions, um, to the verification. So say like there's banks and there's individuals on the network, the banks have a lot more say in what transactions get verified. Whereas Bitcoin is totally anonymous. So it's a lot, so there's three like main characteristics that make Stellar better. 
uh, for event services. It's low latency, which means that transactions go through instantly. It's very scalable. And that's a result of the energy efficiency. It actually doesn't really require much energy at all because it doesn't use a proof of work protocol like Bitcoin does, which requires a ton of computational energy. And that's as a result of David Mazarius and Stellar's uh, weighted trust transactional protocol. So some of the reasons why Bitcoin and blockchain technology are not sort of super, they haven't, they haven't blown up on a level uh, that you might expect based on the level of, of like innovation associated with this technology. As I talked about before, there's high energy costs associated with verifying transactions, but there's technology like David Mazarius' technology and others that uh, work to limit that. There's also a lot of security risks. We don't know how blockchain will work for a lot of these different types of uh, transactions on a high scale. There could be some security vulnerabilities. But in terms of security, it's important to consider the status quo versus, versus blockchain. So banks right now, they have a perimeter security with a lot of integrated data on the inside, and they're not that secure. So if you think about blockchain, you have this like totally decentralized ledger system, and one of the cool things about it is it's totally immutable, so you can't go back and change the record. So in a lot of ways, it's much, much more secure than uh, banks right now. And there's also a lot of government regulations. You think about a government might not be super uh, excited about the idea of having a currency on a distributed decentralized ledger system because they have less opportunity to uh, influence the financial system through um, through stimuli and through like different kinds of uh, rates, rate changes, and stuff like that. And so, just to kind of conclude, where we are now is we have blockchains being used to facilitate the usage of money through Bitcoin, through Stellar Protocol, um, and where we can go basically is to any industry where we can cut out the middleman. So Blythe Masters, who was a former CEO of J.P. Morgan, a former executive, excuse me, said that you should pay you should pay attention to blockchain the way you should have paid attention to the internet in the early 1990s, and a lot of technological uh, backing and a lot of smart people who agree with her. And so if you think about just the opportunity of cutting out the middleman in all, in all these different industries, the potential is, is really exciting. So thanks. I'll take any questions you guys have. Uh, yeah. So if Stellar doesn't have proof of work, then how does that work with like the, or would the record theoretically be mutable if there's no proof of work? So the, the thing about Stellar is that it's completely optimized or it's only usable for the exchange of currency like US dollars and euro. It doesn't have its own cryptocurrency to another person. So basically you have all these people in the network and actually it's in Nigeria right now. There's 200,000 people in Nigeria who are using Stellar. And so basically say one person, say Alice, wants to say, all right, I'm going to send $10 to Bob. And she asks Bob, would you want 10 bucks in exchange for whatever service? And Bob says, okay. And they announce to the network, all right, Alice is giving Bob $10. Mm -hmm. And so... They basically like announce that agreement through a certain like verification system that it goes through, and the money is sent through. So in terms of like the ledger system, it's not as important as it is with Bitcoin, which has its own cryptocurrency because it doesn't have its okay. own cryptocurrency. It's only utilizing like concurrent. Uh, so is that that's then more like Ripple then? It's yeah, it's similar to Ripple actually. So okay. the guys, the Zeros actually worked at Ripple before. But the thing is that this, I don't want to go into technical details of it, but what Stellar does is it takes sort of the basic, the, the, the underlying technology of Ripple, and it adds like a different like, flair to it, basically, that makes it like completely uh, non-latency, whereas Ripple would take like a couple of hours for transaction to go through. This is basically instantaneous. What? Bob, does, this might be stupid, but does Venmo use something like that? So Venmo is an uh, escrow system. Um, it, it, it's not at all like this. Okay. But there's some real world examples would be NASDAQ. So NASDAQ, all their private equity is done on blockchain. This is a very recent change. And uh, IBM just adopted it for their internal structure. So. Yeah. One thing at the, at the beginning you mentioned that if the, so if the internet, I don't know if I'm probably going to get it wrong, but if the, if the value of the internet was in the connections of the value of the blockchain was value itself, yeah, yeah, I can clarify that. So basically, you can compare it to the internet on the fact that what makes the internet so exciting is that everyone has access to it, and its main value is communication. Like people could communicate from all over the world. You could access media that everyone could see at the same time. What what the blockchain sort of <coughs> parallel to that is with blockchain, you can basically communicate transactions, money, any sort of money transaction is basically out there in the world, and everybody can see it, and everyone can verify it, and it's totally immutable. So that's kind of the, the parallel there.